and his wife, Julie, recently developed a weekend course for couples, uh, the Marriage Survival Kit, based on his 25 years of couples research. And of course, it's another ongoing research project, the course itself, as it would be. Um, he, um, he also has mentored many of the important people in our field. Uh, both Howard Markman and Cliff Notarius began as his students. And in talking to Cliff uh, two nights ago, he said of John, there is no area of, the fam of family life to which he has not made significant research contributions. Couples, parenting, marriages over the lifespan, children's adjustment and social development, and on and on. But his, it is his decades-long, diligent, careful, and precise research on what makes marriages succeed or fail that informs all our efforts. And all the reporters here know that whenever I'm talking to them, I say that it is upon John Gottman's research that we build all of our optimism and all of our hope that we can achieve smart marriages. He's the rock <laughs> upon which we build. John Gottman. Turn it off. Thank you, Diane. What I'd like to do is give you an overview of, of the research my laboratory has undertaken in the past few years. And this work is really motivated by one goal, trying to deal with the pervasive and enormous relapse effect uh, in all current marital interventions, as far as we know. Uh, the kind that's been talked about by Jacobson and Addis. And we're really looking at uh, the problem of having uh, effects last in couples, and also dealing with the problem of why it is that couples wait so long uh, from the time they detect the problem in their marriage to the time they get professional help. This area of wait time is of great concern in the medical community uh, to, to minimize <clears throat> the time from when somebody detects angina, chest pain, or a woman finds a lump in her breast to the time she gets into the doctor or he gets into a cardiologist or internist. And uh, Cliff Notarius had a student uh, uh, Jane Bongiorno, who did a study on this wait time and found that the average wait time for couples uh, from the time they detect a serious problem in their relationship to the time they get any kind of professional help, even clergy, is six years. So uh, th that's, another, that's another problem that my lab has been trying to deal with. I, I think the problem is that we've designed marital interventions primarily on the basis of our own clinical experience or ph philosophical uh, religious intuitions instead of on solid empirical knowledge of how marital relationships work. And the one thing that my laboratory has to add to this idea is that we may be in this impasse in intervention uh, that has to do with the relapse effect because we don't understand how marriages work. And what we need is a theory based on process models of how marriages work. And today I'll, I'll present uh, this theory to you, uh, one that I call the sound marital house. And uh, the research first began by trying to look at the question of what is dysfunctional when a marriage is ailing. And five years ago, I reported we could predict with 94% accuracy which marriages would end in divorce and which would remain stable. There was a very orderly set of cascades toward divorce. And now in my laboratory, in two additional longitudinal studies, and a third longitudinal study with Neil Jacobson of physically violent couples, we've re basically replicated these results, and the ability to predict remains over 90%. So I'm fairly confident that I can specify what is dysfunctional in marriages with, what, when they're ailing in terms of the long, longitudinal stability of the marriage and the happiness of those couples who remain married. Furthermore, we can predict in each of three me measurement dom domains, either observing interactive behavior or peripheral autonomic physiology or cognition. Now, are these results uh, surprising or unique? And I, I would suggest that they are, because it's easy to list a baker's dozen of very sensible hypotheses that have been proposed in answer to the question of what is dysfunctional when a marriage is ailing. But almost all of these hypotheses have turned out to be wrong. Of all the prediction studies performed to date, these predictions uh, are the strongest and also the clearest theoretically. Now, the following slide, I think it's the right slide. You can put that on, Jill, uh, shows six uh, dysfunctional, six predictors. These are the six bad habits of ailing marriages. Um, and I'll explain each one as, as we proceed. This, these are the, the six things that I think really are characteristic of marriages when they're uh, undergoing these cascades toward, um, toward divorce 
or, or unhappy stability. The first is that there's more negativity than positivity. And the ratio in stable marriages, happy marriages, is five times as much positivity and, uh, as opposed to uh, about 1.25 times as much negativity as positivity. And the second is the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, uh, which is uh, a term I coined for a pattern of criticism, defensiveness, contempt, and stonewalling. And there are gender differences in these, that there's more female criticism and more male stonewalling. More female criticism than male criticism, more male stonewalling than female stonewalling. The third is the failure of repair attempts, and I'll talk a little bit about what those are a little bit later. These are attempts to really get the marriage off, marital interaction off a negative interactive course. The fourth is negative perceptions of the interaction as it proceeds, or what I call the subtext that accompanies negative interactions. Negative sentiment override, a concept that Bob Weiss proposed that I'll talk about. Um, and uh, negative attributions, which eventually are sort of more long-lasting thoughts that are negative about the partner or the relationship. And eventually recasting the whole history of the marriage negatively. The fifth is flooding, uh, which is being overwhelmed by the way your partner complains and, uh, and feeling sort of physiologically uh, aroused and like you're in danger. And the distance and isolation cascade that accompanies this flooding. The most important part of this distance and isolation cascade is really, <coughs> excuse me, eventually loneliness. And the sixth is really chronic, diffuse physiological arousal and immunosuppression. And uh, if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about the immunosuppression. Now, um, knowing what is dysfunctional has turned out to be not enough to really be able to help couples. And I once thought this ability to predict through describing dysfunction and the cascades toward divorce was enough. After all, knowing what's dysfunctional determines the goals of intervention. And I reasoned that if couples would just avoid engaging in these dysfunctional patterns, then the marriage would probably be okay. And although this sounds logical, it's turned out to be wrong. First of all, I hadn't answered the question, what is the etiology of this, these dysfunctional patterns? What explains how people get themselves into these muddles? I mean, why, why do they start with criticism rather than complaint? And second, I also implicitly thought there were no real additional information to be gained by answering the question, what is functional in marriages that are working well? But the answers to both of these questions have turned out to be critical in designing a theory of how marriages work that could be useful in, in designing interventions. Now, current models of interventions have uh, basic assumptions that underlie them. And let's take a hard look at these basic assumptions that are part of current marital interventions. The first is that the basis of a happy marriage is in the way couples solve problems and resolve differences. The second is that marital happiness is based on effective conflict resolution. The third is that problem solving needs to be based on improving the couple's ability to communicate clearly. And the fourth is, what is most important is empathy and active listening when resolving conflict. Now, on the basis of recent research in my laboratory, none of these assumptions are true. And I'm going to talk about that and suggest what I think is true. Now, basically, the database I'm going to be referring to consists of seven longitudinal studies with a total of 670 couples. And in all these studies, we collect the same basic core physiological measures synchronized to the video of time code, the same interview data, the same questionnaire, and video self-recall, uh, video recall self-report data. These studies all involve demographically representative samples of couples uh, in the communities in which we study um, who, uh, are, who range a great deal in marital satisfaction. And we sort of follow these couples over time. And the cohorts have ranged from the newlywed phase through the retirement phase. And the longest follow-up period to date has been 14 years. And today, I'm going to tell you a lot about the latest and unpublished results of our most recent longitudinal transition to parenthood with 100 newlyweds in Seattle. And in this research done over the past eight years in collaboration with Dr. Sybil Carrere, we evaluated a number of process alternative models. Our goal was to predict from the nature of the marital interaction in the first few months of marriage whether a couple would eventually be divorced or together and unhappy or together and happy. And uh, in addition to all the standard things that we've done in the past, we also built an apartment laboratory in Seattle in which couples live for 24 hours, usually a Sunday, uh, so they can read the Sunday paper with no instructions, just to behave as they normally would at home. We have 
hundreds of hours of tape, people reading in the paper together, by the way, <laughs> stuff like that, making dinner. So there's no, there's no instructions in this. The setting is very comfortable and pleasant and natural, and there's a view of the Mont Lake Cut, and you can see boats going by, and except that there are three cameras that are always on, and the couple wears Holter monitors that collect two channels of electrocardiogram data, and when they urinate, we run and collect samples of the urine and assay stress hormones in the urine. And the, and the, uh, and the morning, we take blood from them and uh, do immunological assays. So it's a very natural environment, except for those <laughs> things. Uh, people adapt, sort of, you know, to this setting. And, uh, and we have observers who are coding their behavior. Now, I'm, I'm going to start, really, by briefly reviewing to you my search for a process model of marriages on the way to building a theory. And this search came out of a happy coincidence of my being on sabbatical three years ago when Jeff Zeig of the Milton Erickson Institute called me and asked me to do a two-day workshop for clinicians on marital therapy. And I told him that I thought I had enough information for about an hour. And he said, uh, and I said, I, I have to decline your invitation. And he said, well, uh, he told me how much he was going to pay me. And then I said, well, maybe I could do a two-day workshop <laughs> after all. And I, I discovered at that time that there were three different kinds of couples who had stable, happy marriages. And they weren't all, uh, they didn't all seem to go through this process of listening well and validating. There, were co there was a conflict avoiding style and then a very passionate sort of volatile couple who argued a lot and engaged in influence processes right away. So I decided that since I was on sabbatical, I could really do more work in finding out how these different kinds of couples validated and listened. And I started really watching tapes and reading transcripts uh, from, from all the couples in one longitudinal study that Bob Levinson and I did together, and I really assumed that the glue of these marriages was listening and validation. And, and what I found was that hardly any of the couples did this, listening and validation. And I didn't really find anybody really asking about feelings or responding to feelings very positively. And yet my validation code, I have a code in my observational system called validation, was getting used with a fair amount of frequency. Now, I never predicted anything. Uh, but I sort of overlooked that conveniently. <clears throat> when I talked to my coders about the absence of this kind of validation, they said, yeah, they'd noticed that also, and they used the, the low intensity part of the code, which the part of the listener giving the speaker active back channels, like head nodding, showing that the listener is tracking the speaker, that's all they saw of validation. But they didn't think it was very important to call to my attention, and, uh, uh, and I was really kind of horrified about this. So then. I looked at the data again and cast a wide net analytically to detect people talking about feelings and the partner responding with either interest or affection or humor or some real validation. You know, I understand how you feel. It uh, makes a lot of sense to me. You'd be angry with me. Uh, you know, I have, have been under a lot of stress lately. I haven't been a very good listener. Those kinds of statements. And they happen in average, all of this stuff happened in average of 4.4 seconds out of 900 seconds. Uh, in 15 minutes of interaction, which is our standard data collection period. And, they, and they, the sequence has predicted nothing. And I was shocked. So here I was going to go tell clinicians how, to, um, how they could slightly modify this active listening model. And in fact, um, I had no evidence, really, that the active listening model was working. And uh, this was very upsetting to me. Now, the interesting thing about the active listening model is that um, it's the most influential process theory about what is functional in marriage. It forms the basis of most complex, multi-component marital treatments of all theoretical orientations, including behavior therapy systems, approaches, and object relations theory. It's called mirroring by Harville Hendricks. So it has a lot of different names, and it's, but it's basic to almost all these interventions. And I assume you're familiar with most of it, but basically what it is is uh, the the uh, speaker is asked to clearly state uh, his or her uh, complaints or feelings, <clears throat> trying to do it in I statements instead of you statements. And the listener is asked to respond empathetically, not argue for his or her position to suspend judgment <clears throat> and to be non-defensive and understanding, to paraphrase and check out, and so on. But where does this idea, this suggestion come from that this is what couples ought to do? It really comes from a version of what Carl Rogers said to do as a therapist, be accepting, non-judgmental, and empathetic. And this is where Bernard Gurney originally got his ideas many years ago in suggesting empathy training for couples. And all of the marital therapies, I think, eventually followed Bernie's lead. 
And they expanded the suggestion, adding other suggestions, uh, like Thomas Gordon's I statements versus U statements. But how was it really decided? It wasn't decided empirically. Now, it may come as a surprise that even in psychotherapy research, the original TRUAC therapist process variables of accurate empathy, warmth, and genuineness were never shown to relate consistently to therapeutic outcome. And in fact, Bergen and Garfield in the 60s and 70s raised a lot of doubt about th uh, these hypotheses. But think about it, it really is also an enormous conceptual leap to apply these Rogerian principles in a marriage because usually the therapist in Rogerian therapy is empathizing with the client's complaints about someone else. When the client starts complaining about the therapist, it's called resistance. <laughs> and now, you know, I, at least I wasn't trained as a therapist to be empathetic when the client was saying that I was a bad therapist. Uh, so let's talk about other, functional, uh, other models of functional marriage. And let me, let me tell you what our results are from looking at a variety of models and then try to put that together for you into a picture and then show how it leads to a theory. And now, one of the models we looked at was really the way the conversation starts. Because although we can get kind of a Dow Jones Industrial Average of the conversation, you know, a, gra a graph of positive minus negative <coughs> codes as they accumulate over the conversation, and those predict what's going to happen to the marriage, we actually found that if we lopped off the last three minutes of it, instead of having 15 minutes of data, just use 12 minutes of data, the prediction was just as good. And we kept lopping off three minutes, and eventually we just had the first couple of minutes of the interaction, and that predicted just as well as anything else. In fact, only 4% of the time <clears throat> did the conversation dramatically change direction. 96% of the time, if it started off negatively, basically negatively, it would continue that way for the whole conversation. So the prediction was, really suggested that startup was very critical. And when we, looked at it, when we looked at startup in more detail, how the conversation starts, just the very beginning, sort of like when you get to a movie, you know, the first couple of minutes of how the movie starts, really important for setting the whole tone. And in fact, there seemed to be this harsh startup or softened startup that was characteristic. Other people have used this term of softening. And uh, Neil Jacobson and Andy Christensen use it a lot in their book on acceptance therapy. But that's what we saw. So for example, harsh startup is, I'm upset lately that you've been emotionally unav unavailable to me. And a softened version of this would be, lately I've been missing you and feeling lonely. So you know, in one case, it's really sort of putting it on the other person. And in the other case, it's really sort of a compliment, in a way, uh, to say you've been missing your partner, instead of that they have a character deficit of being emotionally unavailable. And this harsh startup was predictive of divorce. Also, de-escalation is another process we looked at. And de-escalation really is a process where you go from your partner's being in a negative affective state to your being at least neutral. And in fact, this seemed to be something that husbands really were much more, the, uh, the, pr the prediction of stability was much more from husbands, whereas the startup was much more characteristic of wives. Softened startup by wives was predictive of stability, and uh, de-escalation by husbands was predictive of stability. Another model we looked at was a model that's become more prevalent and uh, particularly seems for some reason to come much more from a Christian perspective, which is the model of anger as a dangerous emotion. And uh, for example, Hendricks has a section in his book um, called The Destructive Power of Anger. And he says, anger is destructive to a relationship no matter what its form. <clears throat> when anger is expressed, the person on the receiving end of the attack feels brutalized whether or not there's been any physical violence." Unquote. And in observing emotions in our observational coding systems in our lab, by looking at specific facial uh, cues, <clears throat> vocal, and content signals, we can discriminate anger from other emotion and other emotional patterns, such as contempt and defensiveness and so on. And basically, you know, we never have found anger to predict anything negative. It doesn't predict anything positive either. You know, it just is there. But if it's blended with defensiveness and contempt uh, and belligerence, then it does predict things negative. In other words, if anger is blended with one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, it in fact does predict divorce. But anger by itself, again in this newlywed study, predicting nothing neg predicted nothing negative. Another pattern, that, another process model that I started investigating is the model of men accepting influence from their wives. Now, here's how this came about. Uh, it took about two years for me to notice this, of looking at tapes of violent couples in the study Neil Jacobson and I have done, of uh, very violent uh, couples. And 
<clears throat> and eventually, I, I noticed that uh, these guys uh, in marital interaction, and this is, uh, our study is really the first study that looked at real conflicts that, uh, that these violent couples were engaged in, not simulated conflicts or just interviewing them in a, individually. I'd never seen any of these guys say to their wives anything like, that's a good point. Uh, I never thought of that. Uh, you know, you're starting to convince me. Or, I never saw it from that point of view. Or, uh, uh, yeah, I don't have to work on Thursday night. I can work on Sunday if your mother's coming over on Friday. There was no accepting influence. I mean, the wife could say something like, in a marriage, you need to communicate more. And these guys invariably would say, I don't agree with that, you know, because, you know, and they have this whole argument. It's like they were always in a mode of rejecting influence. It was very powerful. Once you see it, it's very dramatic. And, uh, and so it really refocuses the whole area of thinking about what's going on in violent marriages in terms of control and dominance and, and the, the marriage being a control struggle rather than the issue of being anger management. Okay? It's a very different uh, perspective. So looking at the normal newlywed study, we also were able to look at this dimension of accepting or rejecting influence and look at, it from, uh, look at wives accepting influence as well as, as uh, husbands. Um, which we did also in the violence study. And in fact, um, the pattern that predicts divorce is husbands accepting influence, rejecting influence from their wives. OK, now, you're, you're, you'll probably recall that in the 20 years of observational research from 1970 to 1990, uh, the best discriminator in the United States and cross-nationally between happy and unhappy couples was negative affect reciprocity. In other words, when one, per, one spouse is negative, you know, angry, disappointed, hurt in some way, and expresses that, there's an increased likelihood that the partner will then become also negative in some way, angry, disappointed, hurt also. And, um, and this was much better discriminated than just the amount of negativity, this particular sequence of engaging one another, hooking one another in into negativity. And it, it, it's, it is discriminated in England, in Germany, in Spain, in Australia, in Holland, and uh, even in parts of New Jersey, it works. So uh, this is very this is one of the phenomena of marriage, uh, and and what we did using this this observational system that I designed a long time ago was we were able to look at what sort of break down negativity into whether or not there's reci reciprocity in kind. In other words, if one person is angry, the other person is more likely to get angry. Uh, if one person is belligerent, the other person is get, gets belligerent. And uh, versus neg negative reciprocity, where one person escalates. So this is a pattern <clears throat> you see in aggressive uh, kids that Jerry Patterson has identified, also in bullies. It's sort of, if you're going to come at me with any kind of negativity, I'm going to be in your face twice as fast with much, much more negativity. This is the pattern of the sort of aggressive, this is the aggressive pattern. It's also the pattern of rejection of influence, is to escalate quickly. And it turned out that negative reciprocity in kind was characteristic of all marriages. Marriages that were happy, stable, you know, everybody does this. Anger is met with anger, okay? So uh, that turns out not to be, and that's really the way it was portrayed when, when uh, observational researchers talked about what was dysfunctional uh, and what was characteristic of unhappy couples is these anger sequences always got c characterized as being dysfunctional. And they're characteristic of all marriages. It's the escalation that is characteristic of marriages headed for divorce, not just res negative reciprocity. So it's a very different kind of dimension. It's really a dimension of power sharing. Uh, and it's sort of the link between affect and, and power in this, in this research. And it doesn't work for women. In other words, women are accepting influence in all these marriages, the marriages that are going down the tubes and the marriages that are working well, women are accepting influence. It's the husband that really makes the difference in this prediction. Another kind of model we looked at was positive affect models. And it's received very scant attention, uh, looking at sort of the positive, the positive emotions, humor, affection, interest, uh, you know, support, emotional support, those kinds of things really haven't been studied that much. <clears throat> and they haven't turned out to be very interesting. But uh, when we looked at it in, with this very specific observational system, uh, we looked at two different models. One is the sort of uh, what I call the Johnny Appleseed model of, of positive affect, which is that maybe marriages that work well, they're just a sort of liberal random sprinkling of positivity throughout the interaction. 
And it doesn't seem like much, but maybe over time it amounts to a lot. Or another model, which is really a contingent model, that positive affect is in the service of de-escalation and soothing. And uh, Levinson and I had suggested about nine years ago that what might be critical in marriage was physiological soothing, both self-soothing and being able to soothe the, uh, the partner. Really being able to make the marriage a port in a storm instead of another storm in people's lives. And the data showed, in fact, that only 30 seconds of positive affect separated divorced from unhappy stable couples, and an additional 30 seconds of positive affect separated happy stable couples from unhappy stable couples. <clears throat> so positive affect is really doing an enormous amount of work in this discrimination. The presence of humor, of affection, of interest, and support in these, in these problem-solving discussions. Um, really are doing a lot in prediction. And it turns out that the positive affect is in the service of de-escalation of the conflict only in marriages that wind up happy and stable. Okay? <clears throat> so for those of you who are researchers, really the path coefficients are significantly different across groups. So it's the contingent model that really winds up discriminating. Now, the next hypothesis really had to do with something Levinson and I suggested, which really has to do with soothing the savage male. And the idea was that uh, really because of our evolutionary heritage, the vigilance system, the system that really detects and looks for danger and stays vigilant about danger, <clears throat> is much more act easily easy to activate in males than females. And so even if you do an acoustic startle experiment, you know, and Levinson has done this and other people have done this, you just suddenly bang on something or have an acoustic noise, very loud blast of sound, you'll find that the heart rate of men goes up much faster than the heart rate of women and stays up longer. Okay? The vigilance system is more easily activated. So what we did here <clears throat> is to look at positive affect and de-escalation <clears throat> and to uh, see whether the extent to which it caused soothing in terms of significantly lowering heart rate. And then secondly, to then see whether that lowering of the heart rate, that contingent soothing, uh, predicted anything in terms of the longitudinal course of the marriage. And it only predicts when it involves the soothing of the male. I mean, th this is one of these rare times when one's, one's favorite hypothesis comes out uh, to work. And, uh, and here, you know, it was really, it's not only the wife soothing the, the husband, but it's also the husband soothing himself. So the husband doing things like de-escalating not only uh, has an effect on the wife, but it really has an effect on himself. And the most powerful predictive effect is the self-soothing. <clears throat> now, to summarize, the functional pattern in marriages, and uh, let me have the next slide, Joe. Now, I wanted, just wanted to show you this uh, because my favorite newspaper, the, world, uh, the Weekly World News, which is the only newspaper to ever have actually gotten a real photograph of God. Uh, I think they'll win a Pulitzer Prize for this photograph of God, because I don't know of any other newspaper that's actually gotten one, has actually seen the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse in Arizona. In Arizona. <laughs> so it's photographed by an off-duty policeman. Uh, can I have the next slide? So they, they're coming. The Four Horsemen are coming. Have the next slide, Joe. Uh, so this summarizes summarizes these models. No, uh, wait a minute. The next slide, I'm sorry. Let's, let's uh, hold, the, uh, hold that one for just a moment. Yes, OK. So these are the fu this is the functional pattern that we discovered. So the wife's startup was softened. The husband accepted her influence. And repair attempts were effective. <clears throat> and I'll talk a little bit more about these repair attempts later. Um, positive affect was used in the service of de-escalation. And physiological soothing of uh, physiological arousal of the male was reduced, and then I'll talk I'll talk about the late the final one a little bit later. Uh, this dialogue with perpetual problems, not gridlock. Okay, the husband had not escalated his physiological activation until it became what I call DPA or diffuse physiological arousal. This happens at around 95 beats a minute, close to the pacemaker ry rhythm of the heart, uh, is when the body starts secreting adrenaline and preparing itself for emergency. And when you get diffuse physiological arousal, which happens uh, very often in marital interaction, um, it makes it very difficult to process information and, or to have access to new learning. And it may be one of the fundamental causes of, of the relapse phenomena. I think it is. Now, OK, hidden implication in these data that I want to point out is 
Uh, there's a lot of times when you focus on only the four horsemen of the apocalypse, <clears throat> what you don't see and what these data really suggest, and you get this from looking at the functional aspects of marriage, a lot of times uh, when I show tapes of couples where there's no emotion in the marital conflict discussion, a lot of therapists in my workshops think that that marriage is fine, but they don't see the emotional disengagement. They don't see the lack of positive affect. Okay? The absence of positive affect really is very critical. And really what we're seeing in those couples is a pattern of emotional disengagement. And a lot of times they really are inadvertently and almost uh, without awareness arranging their lives so they're in parallel. And they're usually in the advanced stages of our distance and isolation cascade. And yet they're talking as if everything's OK, because they're trying to adapt to what they see as, a t as this temporary negative state of their relationship. Now, in the California Divorce Mediation Project, the most common re reason given for divorcing, and I really trust their data, because they've, they've really gotten the trust of the couple in this you know, dissolution process, and they're individually working with both people, confidentiality is assured. So that data, I think, is the best data we have about why it is that marriages are breaking up. And interestingly enough, extramarital affairs are only given as a cause by about 20% of couples in that survey. And severe and intense fighting are only given as a cause by 40, only 40% 40 of couples. 80% of the men and women in that, in that study uh, cite gradually growing apart and losing a sense of closeness, not feeling loved and appreciated as the major cause of divorce. Which is very interesting because if you also read the, what therapists have written about how to treat couples with extramarital affairs, what they're really saying is most extramarital affairs are not about sex, they're about friendship. They're about finding somebody who listens to you and cares about you and is nice to you and, you know, and thinks you're you know, a reasonable human being and not a total you know, jerk. And, uh, and so really, you know, this idea of growing apart is very interesting. And you see this in these couples that are really affectless in their marital interaction. The absence of negativity can be very confusing to some therapists. And they, and they can wind up really sort of taking what the couple is saying as evidence that everything's OK. But you see, in these, you see a pattern in these affectless marriages that the, the marriage feels like it's emotionally dead. So if you use your feelings, you can really sort of see that there's kind of something wrong. They're like passing ships in the night. They're missing each other. There's no passion. They don't seem like very good friends. Uh, there's a lot of tension, a lot of facial tension. And the face is a very good place to pick this up, because you just see you know, uh, a relaxed face just looks totally different, you know, even on video, but personally when you watch it, than a face where there's tension. Uh, it just has a very different look. And there may be a high level of physiological arousal in one or both people in these affectless interactions, unless they're already so, so emotionally dis disengaged that they're very calm with the disengagement. But there's very little attempt <clears throat> on the part of either person to soothe the other. OK, so where are we in, in terms of developing a theory of marriage? I've really given you just kind of a checklist for what happens in, in dysfunctional marriages that replicates across studies, and what appears to be from <clears throat> our research so far in the newlywed study uh, to be characteristic of functional marriages. Um, but based on my analyses, I'm led to the conclusion that the active listening model may be expecting a form of emotional gymnastics from people who at the moment in this relationship are somewhat emotionally disabled by the conflict. You know, that people can't even walk uh, emotionally, and we're trying to make them into, into gymnasts. Uh, it's not that active listening, I, don't, I believe that if you can do active listening, when, you're, when you feel attacked by your partner, and you can actually be non-defensive and be empathetic, it can be extremely powerful. It's just that it may be almost impossible to do. And so uh, Neil Jacobson has told me that <clears throat> he asks a couples, he asks therapists in his workshops how many of them in their last marital argument paraphrased their partner's uh, <laughs> statement of anger and checked it out. And he, no hands go up. Now, I've seen the Dalai Lama do this. You know, I, I went to a talk of the Dalai Lama, and somebody attacked him viciously. And he said he thanked the person for their thoughtful comments and their courage in being able to confront you know, a, a notable speaker uh, personally. And I'm sure Jesus did this. I'm sure Buddha did it. You know, and I'm sure Moses didn't do it. You know. so, I, so I urge you to sort of reconsider this active listening model and, and think about the, our data as maybe suggesting that this approach, uh, this mirroring approach, may be expecting too much of people. And 
I think the proper place for it is where it was intended originally, uh, which is in the stress-reducing redu conversation. So when people at the end of the day talk about how their day went, and the purpose of the conversation is getting back in touch with one another and cooling out and reducing stress, and there's a lot of stress in, increasingly in American families today, that, that really uh, this is where you can empathize with your partner because they're complaining about somebody else, and we find in our laboratory that one of the things that really appears to accompany physiological soothing a lot is when husband and wife get together to trash a third person. And this is very comforting. Uh, that may be the place for active listening and empathy. It's a place where you can really build a friendship, and you're not, you're not under personal attack. Uh, the data suggested, suggest also that in terms of gender roles, it's a two-way street. Uh, that in fact, um, only those newlywed women who are able to soften startup are winding up in happy, stable marriages. And, uh, and really, these results you know, also suggest that there is a kind of uh, emotionally intelligent guy out there who has sort of figured this all out and, uh, and, and really realizes that sharing power and accepting influence is really part of you know, respect. It's part of communicating to a woman that you respect her opinion. <clears throat> and this is very, very important. I mean, you see this reflected over and over again in these you know, silly kind of issues like, you know, who should put the toilet seat down? Now, in terms of physics, it's the same amount of work for her to put the toilet seat down as it is for him to put the toilet seat down. But it means a lot more. You can win a lot more points as a guy if you put the toilet seat down. Okay? And some guys have figured out stuff like this. You know? <laughs> and some guys haven't. So actually, these results, I want to suggest to you, suggest an alternative model of marital therapy. And it's really a model based on gentleness. Um, and, you know, and I've had a lot of trouble uh, convincing TV producers <clears throat> that this is worthy of showing on television. Because it doesn't look like the dramatic stuff you see on these talk shows about how, what family process ought to look like with people getting upset and screaming and yelling at each other and then crying and hugging each other and the audience applauds. You know, it doesn't work that way. I mean, what really seems to happen is people are really softening what they do, how they present their complaints. They're not waiting a long time to present complaints, you know, two, three days, and then they're bringing things up in, and even guys are doing this. <clears throat> they're, they have high ratios of positivity to negativity. They're using positive affect, affection to soothe, de-escalate conflict, and, uh, and to soothe themselves. These guys are also soothing themselves. Now, uh, I'll talk more about this uh, later on, but it turns out these guys are doing a whole bunch of other things that's also very interesting. Um, let me just briefly comment on the, the results on physiological soothing of the male, because while we have some evidence for this, I think eventually we're going to find out that physiological soothing is important for both men and women. And there's evidence, for example, for, for newlywed men and women that if you take blood from couples as they interact, uh, that you can actually find uh, lower levels of stress hormones in, in, uh, in less negative, less hostile marital communication, and also uh, in, in more better immune functioning for both men and women by positive affect. So um, even though we discovered that the husband's content was a real good predictor of the wife's illness um, and not the husband's illness, unless the husband's got lonely, you know, it turns out from study to study, these physiological dimensions, uh, I think, really will show, if we look at, look at them very carefully, that physiological soothing is important for women as well as men. The thing is, there is a gender difference, and the gender difference is pervasive, but it's not huge, okay? So if the vigilance system is activated in a woman, you know, and she's constantly on the lookout for zingers by her husband, you know, for insults, slights, emotional disengagement, you know, this is not good for a woman either. So I just want to be very careful about this hypothesis of physiological soothing of the male. Eventually, I think it's going to be important that both are soothed. Now, let me say we're not done yet, because all these, although these results are interesting and provocative, and they suggest a different model of, of marital therapy than the active listening model, which I think is, in a way, a celebration of confrontation, um, they, they really don't tell us how to help people. And, for example, you can't tell people in distressed marriages to have more positive affect in the service of de-escalation and soothing. You know, <laughs> can't tell them, you can't tell them to be funny. You know, and, it's, for example, the admonition to be funny is often destructive of humor. I, I once saw a TV show where Groucho Marx and Buddy Hackett were guests, and the host said, you are two of the funniest people in the world. Make us laugh. <laughs> 
And what happened was they both got hostile. You know? It's very hard to ask people to be funny. I mean, you, you can get people to be funny <clears throat> if you tell them this is a very serious event. You know? And to take it with you know, the, uh, the appropriate, um, appropriate seriousness that it deserves. And they'll, then they'll start getting silly. Uh, now, the other thing that's, that's a problem with a lot of these results are, are um, they don't explain things. I mean, why, why is it that wives in unhappy marriages uh, are engaging in harsh startup or marriages headed for divorce? Uh, and these results could be interpreted as really blaming the unhappily married wife. She starts the discussion uh, harshly, and it's no wonder the poor guy with diffuse physiological arousal can't accept her influence. And so marriages really uh, fall apart because of these bad women. Um, and these, so the results are really inadequate because they don't give us an etiology for the patterns that are related to happiness or stability. And they don't answer questions like, why would anybody begin with criticism instead of complaint? So um, here's, how this, here's how the theory emerged. It really emerged from attempting to answer these questions of etiology. And first, I wanted to look at processes of repair. How do people naturally repair the interaction when it becomes negative? Even in the most distressed marriages, people make uh, attempts to repair the negative chains of interaction. An example of that is, the uh, problem is, I don't think either of us are paying much attention to what's important to the other. That's a repair attempt made by a husband. Uh, now, these, they occur on the average of one every three minutes. And the more unhappy the couple is, the higher the frequency of repair attempts. The problem is that even, in the, even the most wonderfully phrased repair attempts and the sweetest repair attempts often don't work very well, whereas sometimes the clumsiest and most absurd repair attempts work beautifully. Now, part of what I try to do in these clinician workshops is to teach clinicians to recognize when a repair attempt is happening and to help the couple reframe it as a repair attempt. <clears throat> but what accounts for the success of the repair attempts was the first question. And we could find nothing in the conflict resolution conversation that explained it. And it turned out in an honest thesis by Michael Lorber in my lab that the basis of effective repair was Bob Weiss's concept, the Bob Weiss at Oregon, of positive sentiment override. And the idea that Weiss proposed was that there was a buffer that operates in marriages that work well called positive sentiment override, or PSO. Uh, Positive sentiment override, PSO, is, is a discrepancy between insider and outsider perspectives of a marriage. And so, that, um, so that even if an observer describes a, a message as being sent with negative affect, the receiver doesn't take it that way if there's positive sentiment override. So for example, an, ex an example from Deborah Tannen's book, <clears throat> the wife says irritably, you're not supposed to run the microwave with no food in it. And the husband says, when there's positive sentiment override, the husband says, oh, I didn't know that. Thanks. Uh, and in negative sentiment override, the wife says, uh, hey, you know, you're not supposed to run the microwave with no food in it. So this message will be coded neutral. And the husband's likely to say, with negative sentiment override, don't tell me what to do, you rat. Did you read the manual? Well, I did. You never read manuals. I'm always the one that has to read the manual. You know? So that's negative sentiment override. And Weiss proposed that, that this sort of cognitive state that people get into is an overriding state you know, that really is not, you can't find the explanation of what goes wrong in the marital interaction inside the marital interaction. You have to look at, in the head of people. You know, this is a very cognitive view of you know, what may be going wrong. Now, so the success of repair attempts, Lorber found, was really to be found in the marital interaction, was to be found in this positive sentiment override. Okay. <clears throat> couples who had this positive sentiment override, the clumsiest repair attempts would work. Couples who had negative sentiment override, the most beautifully phrased and well-timed repair attempts would fail. Okay? Now, now you can ask, what determines negative sentiment override and positive sentiment override? Now, so that was the next question. And it turns out to have to do with the nature of the couple's everyday interaction, much of which is really neutral and not effective. And I'll explain it in a moment. There were, there were three other findings that led to the development of this theory that I'm going to tell you about. Uh, the first one was in a study Bob Levinson and I did. We had couples come into the lab after being apart for eight hours. It was a reunion, right? We sent them home if they had talked already. So the first thing they did was talk about how their day went. And then they, then they did the sort of conflict resolution task after that. And what we found was that the ratio of positive to negative affect in the events of the day discussion uh, it turned out to account for 30 to 50% of the variation <clears throat> in the same ratio in the conflict discussion. 
So the way people are talking in these very neutral conversations, you know, where there's not a lot of emotion, turns out to be predictive of the way they resolve conflict. So really this research is directing us away from just looking at conflict resolution. Second, we've studied now the stability of marital interaction over a four-year period, and we've discovered just a remarkable stability to these, to these uh, patterns, particularly in affect. So you look at a couple four years later, and it really looks like they, you know, they just got up and they changed their hairstyles, went to the bathroom, and they're still talking about the same problems in the same way, you know, almost, almost exclusively. <clears throat> now, the, first, the thing I did in looking at these longitudinal data of marital interaction, you know, looking at videotapes separated by four years, that I'd never done before was look at what the couples are talking about. So I always looked at process and emotion and sequences. Now I looked at what they're talking about. And I was quite amazed to find that 69% of the times when couples are talking about a major area of continuing disagreement in their marriage, they're talking about a perpetual problem that they've had for many, many years. These are problems that usually have to do with fundamental differences between them. Only 31% of the discussions really had to do with functional problem solving, an issue that they really could resolve, you know, and that they were moving toward a resolution. So what we did was really try to study what it is that couples are doing in these 31% of the problems when they're really problem solving, as opposed to these 69% of the problems where they're not really solving the problem. They've had this problem for 15 years, 17 years in their marriage. And what, it, what we discovered was that instead of solving problems, what seems to be most important is whether or not a couple can establish a dialogue with their perpetual problems. And this dialogue needs to, be feel, to feel good for it to be a dialogue. And to feel good, the couple needs to make some kind of peace with the problem and have a relationship with the problem. So husband and wife have a relationship with, it, with this problem between them. It's like it's another thing that they are batting back and forth. They may be able to push the problem around somewhat and change their label, level of frustration with the problem and come to some acceptance with the problem. And the amazing thing and the magic here, particularly in looking at the long-term relationships in the study that Levinson, Carstensen, and I did, people have been married 45 years, is that their problem, they appear to be problem solving, but somehow they're talking about a problem they've had forever, right? And, you know, a difference between them that they, that they sort of are working on, but they simultaneously are communicating basic acceptance of the partner. That's the magic, okay? As opposed to when couples have these perpetual problems and they become what I call gridlocked on the problem. And gridlock really is a process that eventually leads to emotional disengagement. So they have this perpetual problem, but they're locked in and, and opposed to each other. The positions become entrenched over time. They vilify one another. And then eventually they disengage emotionally from the problem. And, they, and the marriage starts looking more and more effectively dead. So, this suggests, this finding suggests, that the goal of most therapy ought to be really to minimize conflict resolution. That the goal is really to help a couple move from a gridlock conflict with a problem that's causing continual pain and rejection to uh, really a dialogue with the problem. Not to solve the problem, but to eventually sort of learn to live with it. And, uh, let me skip some of these. Um, now, let me give you one example of a gridlock conflict uh, and, and compare this to a conflict that's not gridlocked. So an issue might be he wants to spend more time with his male friends, and she really resents that time. She wants more time together. And this is a problem they always have. He likes to go fishing or likes to play golf. <clears throat> some, you know, some women are golf widows, you know, and this is you know, a problem we know about. This, they've always had this problem, right? And they're talking about it again. Uh, and, you know, and, and she's saying, the kids really need you now, and it's really important, and you're not home as much. And he says, well, I need this time. If I don't have it, I get real crazy. I get real tense. I've got it. It's the only way I have to calm down. And they talk about this perpetual problem. And that's an example of it. Now, there's an amusement that they both have you know, in this situation when there's a dialogue with the problem. It's almost like they, they quote one another in previous arguments. They laugh about it. There's an amusement. There's, a, there's a, an irritability and an amusement. And so what happens with this blend is a communication basically that says, I'm not very happy about this problem, but it's not a big deal. I still love you, and I you know, think you're a great person. You know, and, but uh, let's try to change it a little bit again. You know, let's have this conversation for the 850th time. Whereas another a couple that's gridlocked, 
she may say, well, I don't like it that you go with your buddies to topless bars and you flirt with women there. And he says, it's not a big deal, you know, I don't really, it's not serious or anything. And she said, she feels personally rejected by this. And she says, well, if it's sex you want, you know, let's spend, let's spend the day in bed together. And he says, well, you know, it's not that really, you know. And he feels very controlled by her. And this is really a very hot issue for him. Uh, and she feels very rejected by him, you know. And this is a hot issue for her. And there's this gridlock. And what you see is no positive affect when they discuss the problem, and just a lot of pain. This is very much like um, <clears throat> the idea of helping couples to, uh, to come to terms with these unresolvable problems is really very much like uh, the kind of relationship we learn to have with chronic physical ailments as we get older, the chronic back pain or the trick knee or the tennis elbow. And we try to make things better all the time, but we realize that there, we learn, have to learn how to live with our limitations. And, and it's the same thing with relationships. And it's very similar to what Dan Weil wrote in a piece in, in, uh, in a book called After the Honeymoon in 1988. And here's what he said, I'll quote from him. He said, choosing a partner is choosing a set of problems. And, uh, and that problems would be part of any relationship. And, that, and, and a particular person would have some set of problems no matter who that person married. If Paul married Alice, and Alice gets loud at parties, and Paul, who is shy, hates that. But if Paul had married Susan, he and Susan would have gotten into a fight before they even got to the party. That's because Paul is always late, and Susan hates to be kept waiting. She feels taken for granted, which she's very sensitive about. Paul would see her complaining as an attempt to dominate him, which he is very sensitive about. But if Paul had married Gail, they wouldn't have even gone to the party, because they they'd still be upset about an argument they'd had the day before about Paul's not helping with the housework. To Gail, when Paul does not help, she feels abandoned, which she is sensitive about. And to Paul, Gail's complaining is att att another attempt at domination, which, as we now know, Paul is sensitive about. Same thing is true about Alice. If she had married Steve you know, instead of Paul, uh, she'd have the opposite problem, because Steve gets drunk at parties, and she'd be angry at his drinking, and they'd get into a fight about it. He gets even louder than she does. If she had married Lou, she and Lou would have had... You, you get the idea. Okay. So, so Weil wrote, uh, there is value, this is a quote, when choosing a long-term partner and realizing that you will inevitably be choosing a particular set of unsolvable problems that you'll be grappling with for the next 10, 20, or 50 years. So the goal of the intervention then becomes, if this is true, if what I've said is true, is that you need to help a couple not solve their problems, but move from gridlock on a problem to um, having a dialogue with the problem. So with that lead-in, let me now talk about the theory. And I'll have, have the other uh, slide, Joe, uh, that is really this theory is represented as a drawing, my, this is the best I can do, uh, drawing something that looks like a house. So I call this the sound marital house, and this is the theory. There are seven components of this house. <clears throat> the foundation, the bottom of it, is called the love map. And it really involves a couple knowing one another and periodically updating this knowledge. The second story, and you know, I don't think it's any accident that the Bible talks about knowing as a metaphor for making love. And this is really what this is about. Um, the second story of the house is the fondness and admiration system, which we found is the antidote for contempt. Now, it's well known that we just talk about these two levels, the, first bo the bottom two levels the love maps and the fondness and admiration system. It's well known that, that over half of the divorces occur in the first seven years of marriage. And we found that much of this involves a cascade toward divorce that follows the birth of the first child, in which 75% of all couples, mainly wives, experience a precipitous drop in marital satisfaction, while 25% don't. The drop in marital satisfaction is part of this cascade toward divorce. And in our longitudinal research on newlyweds, we tried to discover what, if anything, in the first few months of marriage would predict whether a couple would wind up in the 75% or the 25% when they made the transition to parenthood. And those were the two things, the amount of cognitive room a person, particularly husbands, allocate for the marriage and the life of their spouse. And the husbands who have a map of their wives' worlds and keep knowing their wives um, wound up in the 25%. And also those husbands, particularly this predicted for both wives and husbands, but a little stronger for husbands, was uh, spontaneously saying things that you admire 
and like about your partner, and actual fondness, actual physical affection in the oral history interview, a history of their, uh, an interview that, that interviews them about the history of their marriage and their philosophy of marriage. And so here, you know, in our interventions, we have things related to each of these things <clears throat> that uh, in, introduce the concept of love maps. We have a board game that I made up where people actually play a game uh, and have to answer questions like, well, who is your wife's least favorite relative? Uh, who was your who is your wife, one of your wife's best friends when she was growing up in childhood? What color is your wife's eyes? What side of the bed does your wife prefer to sleep on? And you'd be surprised how many people don't know stuff like that. And it really is very light. So all of the stuff that we do in our workshops are designed in order to prevent relapse, which is the goal, to be very low cost psychologically. Very low confrontation, you know, very, uh, they're designed to have people say, I can do this, this is easy. You know? And people enjoy playing the board game. And then we have people actually construct love maps of their re real love maps of their partner's everyday world. So you've, you've got to, to build a love map, you have to know, you know, who's your wife's friends? You know, who are some people at work that, you know, are potential rivals or, you know, people who aren't very positive toward her? Who are potential friends? What are some of her hopes, hopes and aspirations in life? What are some of cur her current stresses and worries? And both people learn this about one another. <clears throat> and the same thing with fondness and admiration. You can build fondness and admiration uh, through exercises. And, and, and we suggest that if the fondness and admiration system is dead, that uh, there's nothing that a therapist can do to help that marriage. That's really very critical. The third level of the, of the sound marital house is the emotional bank account. And the emotional bank account, this, this idea is really uh, what I was talking about in the apartment lab, that, and I call it turning toward versus turning away. In these very simple moments, I gave you the example of the, the, guy, the guy or the, or the wife brushing your brushing teeth in the morning. But the very simple things like one person saying, uh, isn't that a beautiful boat? And then you know, the, the husband or wife putting down the newspaper and saying, yeah, you know, I think that's a schooner. Is that a schooner? Uh, as opposed to the person just munching the hamburger, not responding at all. Now, it's not that marriages that are going well um, that, in fact, they always respond to one another, and they're always so terrific. But it's a proportion that makes the difference, right? And the proportion appears to be more like 60% <clears throat> of the time there's turning toward versus 60% of the time there's turning away. So these three first levels of the sound marital house, the love maps, the fondness and admiration system, and the turning toward versus turning away ratio, which is really kind of like emotional money in the bank, determine the positive perspective. If there's something wrong with those three levels, the theory suggests you get the negative perspective, you get negative sentiment override, Bob Weiss's concept. And that is what works in, in facilitating repair or making repair not work in the next box, which is uh, when people actually go to solve their problems, the problems that are solvable. Now, what about the problems that are not solvable? In, in the, in the, by the way, let me just mention, in the, in the effective problem-solving area, we've really identified four things that are functional in marriages that are headed for uh, stability and happiness that really are softened startup, accepting influence, and repair and de-escalation, and then finally compromise. So in these, in these conflicts that we, you see, um, conflicts that can't be resolved, not, not perpetual problems, there is a movement toward some kind of compromise or balance at the end. And positive affect is, is in the service of this de-escalation, de but it's not programmable. You can't program positive affect, but it happens by itself when people have this positive perspective. Okay? It just naturally happens. So, these are the things that I, that I think are programmable that then lead to the positive perspective, which then leads to positive affect being in the relationship in the, during conflict resolution. Now, what do you do about, um, first of all, what do you do about couples where there's emotional disengagement already? And what is the basis of the difference between gridlock conflict and conflicts, perpetual uh, problems around which couples have a dialogue. And this it has to do really with the, the, the next two levels of the sound marital house. The idea of dreams and aspirations. Feeling like, you're, like your marriage is not in the way, but actually facilitating 
your dreams and aspirations in life. And really, this has to do with meaning. Okay? And one of the things that I think has been really sorely neglected in many approaches to marital therapy, um, and you know, this goes for object relations approaches as well, is, uh, is the symbolic meaning, the symbolic value of people's positions when they're gridlocked. Even on very trivial issues, a trivial issue that seems silly, why can't they resolve it? Why don't they take your advice? You give them such great advice as a marital therapist. What's wrong with these idiots? Why don't they take your advice? The answer, I think, is that uh, their symbolic value to the position, even a stupid position, has meaning. Okay? And it relates to what's in the attic, the dreams, the narratives, the myths, and the metaphors that people have surrounding the problems. These symbolic values are really critical. <clears throat> now, what's, what's really interesting is that these dreams that are, that you have the gridlock position here, and the dreams are really hidden because the marriage has to feel safe for people to be able to talk about their dreams. They're like these little prairie dogs, you know, in South Dakota, where if you ever see pictures of them, you know, they pop up, and as, at the sign of a predator, you know, they're gone. That's the way the dreams are. You know, they automatically vanish. And so a lot of times the couples don't really remember them uh, at all. Now, one of the problems here is that when you try to get people with this gridlock conflict to, to be able to articulate uh, to one another the meaning of their position, the narratives, the metaphors, uh, it, you have to make the marriage safe enough to do this. A lot of times, the problem with women is that they're all too willing to give up their dreams for the sake of the relationship. Whereas guys are threatened by the, by the partner's, by the wife's dreams. Okay? They have, the problem there is some kind of sense of entitlement that makes them unwilling to share power. But nobody really wants to be so powerful in a marriage that they're successful in crushing their partner's dreams. Nobody really wants to be that dominant in a relationship, uh, unless they're very pathological, uh, that you know, they have been successful in creating a depressed, inactive you know, slug of a partner. People want you know, a lively, creative p friend you know, in their relationships. And that's what, that's what uh, this intervention tries to do, this Dreams Within Conflict interview. <clears throat> really look at the symbolic meaning of these positions in, uh, in a gridlock conflict. A lot of times, this symbolic meaning goes back to childhood. But this is the kind of stuff that Studs Terkel gets at when he interviews people <clears throat> in their attic. You know, it's like, uh, you know, you talk to some couples and, you know, they'll tell you something like, you know, well, I'm a Babcock, you know, and we Babcocks, this is what it means to be a Babcock, you know. And they have, it's almost like they open the photo album and go back, you know, like I open my photo album and I say, this is my great grandfather, Meyer Hawker. And this is the kind of guy Meyer Hawker was. He had huge hands, he was a butcher, you know. And this is the kind of guy he was. And this is, here's some stories about Meyer Hawker. You know, and I'm really going like this. You know, I'm proud of my great-grandfather. And it really relates to what I think a home is, or what I think a good son is. You know, or I'll say, well, I can't have my parents stay in, uh, in a hotel when they come visit, because it violates the fifth commandment. It's dishonoring my parents. It's these symbolic meanings that go into religious values, philosophies, uh, metaphors, mythologies, and they are at the root of symbolic conflict, of, of gridlock conflict, these symbolic issues. Now, let me, let me say uh, a bit about our intervention and talk about the philosophy of it. There are four components to this philosophy uh, of implementing the sound marital house in intervention. The first is making the therapy primarily dyadic instead of triadic. It's really getting the therapist out of the marital therapy as much as possible. And really, the reason for this is that if the, if the therapist is so prominent at doing things uh, in analyzing the interaction and in calming the couple down, and if really the therapist is really trying to be real smart. Um, now, one of my very good friends, Ross Park, is a master at, uh, at teaching seminars. And one of the things about Ross that is so great is at the end of the seminar, the students say, you know, I'm really very smart. I've got some talent in developmental psychology. And they hardly ever say, you know, that Ross is really smart. That Ross Park is really a smart person. And this is what I'm really recommending here, is that if the therapy is more dyadic, the couple's going to say, hey, you know, we can do this. 
this is not so hard. We can resolve our conflicts. We're pretty good. And they're not saying, you know, that Gottman is really brilliant. You know, what a great therapist. They're saying, yeah, he's okay, you know. I mean, I think he's overpaid, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but we're the ones who really are doing this. He's not doing it. And so a lot of what we're doing in our lab is really trying, experimenting with very brief interventions. So this recommends really that the couple, uh, after you get in touch with them and find out how their week was, you have them talk to each other and screw up and get into states of diffuse physiological arousal right in your office. And then what you do is you only plunk in one suggestion that they can assimilate in a Piagetian sense of assimilation. They can take this one idea and then they go back and use it and make it their own in their own way, their own, you know, consistent with their own personalities, and they go back for 10 minutes and do that again. So, the, so one part of the philosophy is really making the therapy dyadic instead of triadic. And um, the second part is the role of emotion. And my own philosophy about the role of emotion in marital therapy is exactly the opposite of Murray Bowen's in two ways. Uh, now, one of the things that, um, if, you, if you read this uh, chapter by Papero in the uh, Jacobson and Gurman book on couples therapy, here's what he said about Bowen's theory of emotion. Papero said, Bowen described the continuum based upon the ability of a person to keep separate the emotional and intellectual systems and to maintain a choice between them. He called this a scale of differentiation of self. People with no ability whatsoever to separate them uh, had, a, had a rank of zero. Those with the ability to differentiate between emotional and intellectual systems and operated continuously under the guidance of separating emotion and reason uh, got 100. <clears throat> okay, so this is the basic idea. And, and this view of emotion as being opposed to reason is, was really quite prevalent in the early years of psychology. The Yerkes Dotson law looking at performance and anxiety was an example of this. <clears throat> but more recent neurophysiological thinking has suggested really that emotion is essential to thought. And so in Damasio's book, uh, which, is, which is called Descartes' Error, he had a patient whose emotional brain had been inadvertently taken out when a tumor was removed, but his thinking remained intact. And the guy was unable to solve complex problems because he could not use intuition to prioritize lists of what was relevant and ir irrelevant to the problem at hand. So really, emotion and reason go together, not the way Bowen suggested. And our research on meta-emotion also suggests that people's negative emotions and philosophies about basic negative affects like sadness, fear, and anger determine the way they, re they respond to these emotions. And the idea in meta-emotion philosophies of rationality opposed to emotionality plays a prominent role as does the view of positive emotions as a counterweight to negative emotions. Now, this, the, the social psychological theory proposed by Clore, or Tony, and Collins uh, analyzes what might be called the setting conditions of most affects and represents a detailed analysis of the appraisal of emotional experience and can be a, a guide for retraining people whose meta-emotion philosophy leads them to avoid processing emotional experiences. But the idea really is that emotion and reason go together. And contrary to what Bohm was saying about how you have to calm people down, you have to say, now wait a minute, you know, Phyllis, quiet, Harry, quiet, now look, calm down. You know, and the therapist is doing this role of soothing and then saying, okay, let's look at what just happened between you. Calm them down, get rid of the emotion, right? And then reason can come in. Now let's analyze. Calm down, you're not yelling anymore? Now we can talk. Wrong! When they're upset, when they're yelling, that's when they have to learn about emotion, their emotion. Their emotion is a guide to understanding how to interact. It's state-dependent learning that you need, this is, this is what I propose, in marital therapy. Have them be upset. Have their heart rates be 140 beats a minute. And then talk about how they're feeling. Don't calm them down. Because then the next time they get angry, they don't have access to those learnings if they've learned it in a calmed down state. They get angry and their heart rate gets 140 beats a minute. They can't remember what you said. But if they learn it in a state of arousal, they can. So that's a very different view of emotion and reason in this philosophy. Third, the therapist's role in soothing. Bowen also viewed the therapist's role as similar to a control rod in a nuclear reactor. The, the therapist calms the interaction down so that now they can really reason and analyze the interaction. And then they get insight, and the insight changes the marital problems. Wrong, okay? I suggest, wrong. That in fact the therapist does not play this role. 
they have to play that role. Because you maximize relapse when you have the therapist doing the job for the couple of physiological soothing. If they don't learn how to do it, then they can't do it when they're riding home in the car from the therapy session. They start screaming at each other. They say, you know, where, where is that Gottman when we need him? You know? you know, I need him to calm you down now so we can talk about things. So they have to learn, they have to get into a state of diffuse physiological arousal in your office, and then they have to do the job of soothing, not you, okay? So they have to come away saying, not that Ross Park is a really smart guy, but we can do this, you know, this is easy. And that leads to the fourth part of the philosophy, which is low psychological cost. Intervention should seem easy to do. It should not feel like you have to be the Dalai Lama or Jesus or Buddha to do this, to have a marriage. Um, so making love maps is really pretty easy. You know, even you know, the sort of classical engineer that has no emotions can make a map. Okay, so who are your friends? You know, can do this. And if you break things down into steps that are doable, I suggest that that, that will work. So there are three parts to the intervention. And uh, the first part of the intervention is really changing the setting conditions. Now, I don't suggest that these parts of the intervention be sequential. They have to be integrated. The hub of the intervention is really for most couples, going to be this dreams within conflict uh, intervention. The intervention that really looks at the symbolic meaning of issues around which people are gridlocked. This is going to take you back to people's childhood in a lot of cases, to how they view anger, fear, sadness, the expression of emotion, how they, what a home is, you know, what love means, what pride means, what it means to be a dignified human being, all those kinds of really symbolic things you know, that really are the basis of the culture that people create when they create a new marriage and a new family. You have to go back and look at that. That's the hub of the intervention. But it's not going to work unless you change the setting conditions that lead to the conflict. In other words, most couples come into therapy with the mistaken idea that if they solve their conflicts and their problems, they'll be happy. And actually, if they solve their conflicts, there'll be a void. You know, because the place they get together for a lot of couples is around the conflict. They have to have these positive parts of the relationship. So if the relationship, if the therapy and the intervention is really building these positive parts all along the way, learning how to connect in everyday interaction, this is the basis of romance. This is the basis of good sex. You know, it is not, you know, how you touch people's breasts that matter, you know, or how you like to be touched. That's not unimportant. But what really is the basis is whether you want this person touching you at all. And Schnarch has really emphasized this in his new book. You know, integrating really the emotional affective parts of the relationship, uh, which have to do with respect and admiration and knowledge of one another and understanding of one another's inner worlds. You know, this is the basis of romance. So unless the therapist and the intervener builds that, the love maps, the fondness and admiration system, the turning toward tur versus turning away, this emotional bank account. The problem solving isn't going to work, first of all. Repair won't work as a process. And second of all, if, if they do solve all their problems, if you could wave a magic wand and solve all their problems, they'll have nothing between them. This is very dramatic, I think, in these violent couples, uh, which really surprised me when you interview them and you say, you know, uh, what do you guys do for fun? You know, it turns out they don't do stuff like rent a video and make popcorn and watch the video, or take the family to the zoo, or go to the movies, or go out to dinner. They don't do that stuff. They're very lonely, very, very lonely. And in fact, the only place they come together is around the conflict, okay? And it's very dysfunctional. But this is, to some extent, true of all, all marriages. So you have to change the setting conditions, and then you have to change the way the couple moves toward uh, functional problem solving. Now, that doesn't mean that that's all there is to it, because uh, you have resistance to deal with, and there are many sources of resistance. And um, these sources of resistance are really too complex to talk about now, but they, but they really involve all kinds of uh, individual psychopathologies that, as you could see, would militate against the, the sound marital house theory working. So for example, you know, some people, when they hear fondness expressed by their partner, they don't believe it, you know, because they don't have a background of believing it. And so we interview people and say, well, how did your parents show you that they loved you? Or how did your parents show you that they were proud of you? People will start crying, because they never did. And they're constantly trying to still show their father that they're worthwhile. 
And so a lot of this really goes back a long way. And you can get at it in the meta motion interview. But when you encounter the resistance, you'll see that for some people, this doesn't work. You know, the idea of communicating basic acceptance, even though you're trying to work on change. This is a very complicated paradox for people to understand, right? The only way you can change, as Jacobson and Christensen point out, is if you don't have to change, right? This is the paradox of therapy, too, right? You know, the only way you can really change is if you feel safe enough, and you can't feel safe if you feel criticized. So you'll come into uh, contact with the resistances to change that really have a lot to do with individual uh, relationship histories and also individual psychopathology, what Tom Bradbury has called enduring vulnerabilities in people, in individual personality and character. <clears throat> and you know, the most difficult for marriages, I think, really have to do with antisocial behavior patterns and, uh, and you know, other kinds of things that go along with making it difficult for people to really relate to one another. Psychosis, past trauma, sexual abuse, and so on. So in terms of resistance, the only thing I can really talk about that, um, that I think is, you know, is the most interesting approach I've seen to dealing with resistance is Bill Pinzoff's book, his recent book, um, that is called something like Integrated Systems Problem Solving Therapy or something like that. Got everything in the title. And it's a brilliant approach, I think, to family therapy because uh, what Pinzoff suggests is that, is that the therapy be based not on the symptoms, the presenting symptoms of the family, but on the nature of the resistance the therapist encounters. Okay. So you start working with a plan, and when you encounter resistance, that tells you what kind of therapy to take is the best approach. And in some cases, it's going to be object relations therapy because you're seeing projective identification and splitting and all those kinds of things. That's the resistance. In other cases, that's going to be completely inappropriate therapy. You know, and in other cases, there are biological limitations, uh, biologically based depression and so on. So Pinzoff has a really, I think, brilliant approach to this whole question of resistance. I want to just conclude my talk by saying something about the sociological and anthropological understanding of the gender asymmetry implied by the, the data I've talked to you about. And these differences are not based on a political view, although all of these differences I to talked to you about really appear to support feminist views of families. And I've learned from experience that people can get very upset by these gender asymmetry. And you know, if you read carefully the original uh, system series that inspired a lot of us to go into family therapy or marital therapy, you know, the Václavic and Haley and those guys, they were very careful about not saying different things for men and women. You know, uh, I, you know, I think they, they avoided this, and it really suggested that uh, the same processes are true, regardless of, of whether it's a male or a female. And they also suggested that it doesn't matter how old the kid is, but you know, the, really what we're learning is that it really does matter. And women are very different from men. And, uh, and in fact, uh, this fall I attended a national conference on men and families at, at Penn State. And this conference was aimed at really dealing with some basic facts about men and families. And we're really working right now at a period of major transition for families. It's a very exciting period in which to be do doing therapy and research because there's huge variability in families today. Um, but here are some of the facts that the people in this conference were trying to deal with. One is when there's marital conflict, men but not women withdraw from their children. And another finding by, uh, by Ross Park uh, and Susan Dickstein is that babies do not socially reference unhappily married dads, but they do unhappily married moms. So one-year-old babies, when they're worried about danger, they look back and they try to see well, the parent, what the parent's facial expression is. And if the mom is, looks scared or worried, they stop and start crying. If the mom looks relaxed, they'll go off a cliff even, you know. So the babies really are looking to the parents for social information. They don't do that with their unhappily married dads. So the dads have already withdrawn so much, even from their babies. Uh, after divorce, a minority of dads see their kids at least once a week. And throughout the United States, there are organized movements that are reaching out to men. And we really need to pay attention to these informal movements, because men are getting all kinds of advice. The Promise Keepers, the Robert Bly Mythopoetic Movement, the Million Man March on Washington, and the many radio stations and programs of the religious right, the father training programs throughout this country, are all giving men a wide range of advice on how to be in families, how to be dads, how to be married, 
And this advice ranges a great deal in terms of how authoritarian and confrontative it's advising men to be, how emotional it's advising men to be. And we need to be aware of these forces that are operating in our families that we're treating. There's a massive amount of father hunger in today's men. And many of these men are vowing to be a different kind of father than the one they had. And sociologically, there's been an abandoning of the male mentorship that had characterized the United States for many centuries. Industry and the workplace in general uh, has abandoned its lifetime covenant and commitment to men for a family wage. I mean, it used to be in the 19th century, you had, your kids had to work, you couldn't make a living. They didn't pay men enough. And so this idea of a family wage emerged in the beginning of the 20th century. That's been abandoned now. So the idea of industry really giving health insurance and retirement benefits. So, and the other thing is men have suffer, suffered great losses. The loss in the breadwinner role in their identity and in the sense of entitlement that they were expected to have in the 50s. The massive emergence of women into the labor force has spelled not only economic but psychological empowerment of women. And as a result, increasingly women no longer have to put up with bad marriages. And they're asking for new things of their men. And despite the rise of the dual career couple, there have been only minuscule changes in the extent to which men share in the housework chores and childcare responsibilities and, and families. Some men are changing dramatically, <clears throat> others are not. And still others are going through uh, reversion to confrontation with their wives and gender war. Now, I think we need to understand these, these gender differences uh, the origins of male inequality and domination of women in our species, homo, homo sapiens, really, you know, only been around for a million years, and also our anthropological evolutionary heritage and how things vary in different cultures. And much, much of this knowledge already exists. Peggy Sanday, S-A-N-D-A-Y, uh, wrote, I think, a brilliant book on this, examining the origins of male domination of women in 186 hunter-gatherer cultures. And here's what she found. First of all, in all but nine cultures, there was a clear gender role specialization in the jobs that men and women did. So gender role specialization was, is really characteristic of almost all, these, almost all human societies. But it doesn't necessarily in, imply male dominance. This only happened about half the time. Now, there weren't any female dominant cultures. I think that's really interesting. There are only equalitarian and male dominant cultures. Now, what were the dimensions that accompanied greater ma male dominance or equality between the genders? Here's what she found. In male dominant cultures, food was scarce and life was hard. And large game, uh, and there was a lot of danger. Second, <clears throat> the, culture the male dominant cultures tended to hunt large game, almost entirely a male activity. And large game was almost always more valued than other food sources, although it was rare that people really had large game. In most, in the more equalitarian cultures, not only was food more plentiful and environmental conditions not as hard, harsh, uh, but food was obtained primarily by gathering and hunting small games, usually trapping. In most equalitarian cultures, men participated in the care and raising of infants, not children, but infants. And there was strong female representation in the symbols of the sacred in those cultures, especially the culture's creation myths. Now, Sande also studied cultures that moved from, from uh, male dominant to equalitarian or from equalitarian to male dominant and found the same patterns. Now, here's the fascinating thing about Sande's work. I think we're living through precisely that kind of period in our history that Sande talked about. And think of the evidence. Food's not very scarce today in general. Life is not very hard. In most places, there's little direct danger from predators. Um, there, there are professional police systems in most places that work to varying degrees. <clears throat> Our culture does not hunt large game. It gathers food in grocery stores, and men can do this. Uh, and in our culture, general, generally, the food is plentiful. The environment, environmental conditions are less harsh. Today, more men participate and are interested in participating in the care of raising infants. Men participate in Lamaze classes, diapering, feeding, classes in how to play with babies are increasing worldwide. College men today are much more interested in being better fathers and in taking family life courses. And this is true in these, in these movements, these grassroots men's movements. <clears throat> and I believe that in, we're also seeing increasingly strong female representation in the symbols of the sacred in our cultures, uh, in, in, in various religions. So for example, you had the New York Times Sunday Magazine that had a section on female icons. Life Magazine at Christmas did a whole section, whole 
whole issue on the Virgin Mary that showed that the Virgin Mary has changed in the way people think about her. Uh, more and more Catholics are, are going to places of worship that emphasize the Virgin Mary's role. And in the Annunciation, she's now described as having an active role uh, with the angel Gabriel in deciding to be the mother of Christ. Okay? So the Virgin Mary is changing. She's becoming a much more interesting woman. You know? <laughs> and, she's, you know, and she's becoming a symbol. And the symbols of God are becoming more female in other religions. So in Judaism, even in Orthodox Judaism, there are movements that emphasize the Shekinah, which is the female spirit of God, qualities of God that involve compassion, forgiveness, and also these are more important in creation studies. So we're living in the midst of a worldwide revolution in women's rights, one that is millennia overdue, and this process is attempting to correct the enormous imbalance that existed, has existed in human culture for so long. I think it's much more important than anything else going on, like the fall of the Soviet Union. It's affecting the family throughout the world. Now, I'm not saying it's happening everywhere. You know, there are some places. But even in the resistance to it, you see the power of it. So, you know, if you take a look at what happened in Afghanistan when the Taliban took over Kabul, what's the first thing they did? I mean, imagine if you were a general leading a guerrilla movement, and you win, and you take over the capital. So the first thing you do is you ban women from getting an education. I think that's amazing, you know? Why would you do that? Because this really, you view this as really threatening the family. So as women become economically and psychologically empowered, and they no longer stand from for bad marriages, men are floundering. You know, men are undergoing enormous polarizations. And you even see things like Robert Bly writing uh, things like, don't let a woman's moods run the house. That's a quote. Urging, in effect, men to ignore women's emotions. And there's been an equation in a lot of these movements of men being unemotional, very misguided. And as Ron Levant has emphasized, we really do not need uh, approaches to intervention in families that drive men away from women. And, and build a wider, a wider gap. So I think what my data really show is that there's an emergence of uh, a new emotionally intelligent husband and father. And, um, and I'll just say that really basically uh, this guy is not only making love maps of his wife's world, he's doing it for his kids too. He's going to the preschool or to the school and finding out the schedule. He's finding out what his daughter's interest, interests are. And he's having much more interesting conversation with, conversations with his sons and daughters. And he's more engaged emotionally in the daily world of his children. And this guy is getting a lot more meaning out of families. Okay? And the workplace does not support this. The, and increasingly, the workplace is not supporting father involvement in families. And that's something that has to change on a policy level as well. Can you accept this one? Absolutely. <laughs> Especially from you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is this on? Yeah, it's terrible to stop this. Um, really awful, but we do have this schedule. Um, we're supposed to be in session in five minutes. The east, east rooms are over this way, and we are given, as I told you, a lot of stuff to think about. And our goal, I guess, is to, to get this out to the, as many people as we can. Can I give you a copy of this talk? And maybe yeah. you can make it available for them. He's going to give us a copy of the talk, make it available. What a gift he gives us. <laughs> <clears throat> Just brought a few of them. He just brought a few of them. I will sell these for a hundred dollars a piece. <laughs> See me later. Uh, this is all.